Hey fellow SweetScript developers, Eric from Stoic Software here again. In this video, we are going to be discussing a design pattern I really like that you can apply in many different SweetScript scenarios. Uh, but before we get started, if you would like to become a confident, competent SweetScript developer yourself, uh, you can get started right now with my free email course on the best resources for learning SweetScript. You will find a link down at the top of the video description. All right, let's get started. Let's start with two very common approaches that I see in SweetScript. On the left side here, we have a client script that implements the field changed handler, which contains logic for reacting to several different fields. So we are reacting to the entity field changing, the item field changing, or the quantity field changing. And each one of those does several different things. Um, we just have comments here, uh, but you can imagine that, you know, perhaps each comment there is a multi-line complicated process or even a simple process. Um, and then on the right, we have a sweetlet, which processes both get and post HTTP requests. And then also handles a default case if somehow we get uh, a different request type. And again, each one of those does um, different complicated, potentially complicated at least, processes. Could be uh, really long, in-depth code there. Uh, so you'll notice in the client script, we use an if-else block to uh, route our different logic. And in the sweetlet, we use a switch. Uh, they have the same, basically the same net effect, but uh, I'm gonna show that this pattern can be applied to either of these cases, uh, and many more actually, but these are the examples we'll use. So these that you're looking at now are the anti-patterns. They are the bad examples. Um, and we are going to use the event router pattern to fix them. Now when I see code like this, I quite honestly have a strong emotional uh, visceral reaction. Um, if I were performing a teardown for a client and came across code like either of these examples, um, that immediately sets off alarm bells in my head. And I know that we're going to have a lot of opportunities for improving the code. Code written this way, uh, like you see here, is extremely hard to read, hard to follow, it's hard to maintain, and it does not scale. If we continue applying this anti-pattern approach, um, let's say we want to add our business process changes a little bit and we, we need to react to more fields uh, in our client script. Let's see. Um, you know, perhaps we need to react to the amount changing, the rate changing. As you continue adding more fields or as the individual uh, processes for a field changing get more and more complicated, This just quickly grows and grows and grows and grows and grows uh, without end. It gets even more complicated and harder to follow if maybe several of the branches share similar or the same logic um, or repeated code. So this quickly becomes just a giant nightmarish mess. Um, so how can we untangle this mess? Or better yet, how do we even avoid this mess altogether in the first place? Uh, so I believe that the event router pattern is a great solution for that. Now, if you've watched many of my other videos, particularly my teardown videos, you'll know I really don't like these large uh, if else blocks or switch structures at all. Um, and I tend to aggressively break my code down into small functions. And the event router pattern will be no exception to that. 
Um, Event Router is certainly not a widely established name. It's just the most applicable name I've come up with, given how I typically ap apply this pattern in my suite script. So let's apply that example to these two scripts. We'll start with the sweetlet. So I'm going to move the bad sweetlet over to the left side. And we will rewrite it on the right side with the event router pattern. So the first step in this pattern is to take the different branches that our logic goes through. So in this case, uh, each case uh, of our switch, we want to take that and encapsulate it into its own function. So we want to make one function for every route that we have. So there's one route for handling the get request. There's one for handling the post request. And there's the default case, uh, which is basically an error state. Okay, so I'm going to make uh, a separate function for each of those routes. So then if we pretend that the comments are, you know, actual code blocks, the first step would be to take that code, remove it out of our entry point, out of our switch, and put it into the respective uh, handler function. So I'm going to take the get request code, cut that, put it in the handle get method. I'll do the same with the other two routes. Okay, so we've moved all of our actual business logic out into separate handler functions. So now all of our logic, um, the different routes of our logic are isolated in their own separate function. So they're not clouding each other, they're isolated from each other. So the next step then is to kind of implement the conditional that we have. Um, so to replace the switch statement basically. And so the basic idea of an if else or a switch statement is to map a condition to a set of logic. And the event router is going to do that exact same thing. We're going to map uh, a condition, in this case the request method, to uh, a piece of logic, which in this case are each of these functions. And JavaScript provides us with a great mapping function, or feature rather, not function, a mapping feature, which is a plain old JavaScript object, which maps a key to a value. So the next step here is to create an object that will map our conditions to the appropriate function. So the conditions are the keys of our object. So in this case, we're going to do this this way. The condition, the first condition, is when we have a get request. So I'm going to take that. That is the key. And the value the, is the logic that we want to execute when we get a git event, which is the handle get function. So whenever we receive a get request, that maps to the handle get function. Notice that I am not calling the function. I'm simply providing the name of the function, a reference to the function. I'm not invoking it here. Now the other route is our post event. And so we set the post as the key and the value will be our handle post function. And so at this point we've, we've completely eliminated the need, almost completely eliminated the need for our switch. I can honestly get rid of the guts of the switch. The only thing we have left to replace is this part. So we are switching on 
the request method. So the request, this context request method, is what determines which route we take. And so what we want to do is check first, and the this event router object defines all of the routes that we have. So what we want to do is check, do we have a route defined for the request method that we receive? So I'm going to cut that. And so we're going to check, do we have a function? So this is going to come in as, say, a get request. And so we look in the event router for the get property. And that will map to the handle get function. Or if it was post, it would map to handle post. So when we do have a route defined, we want to invoke the function. This is the same, and we can just invoke it by adding the parentheses at the end. When we don't have a function, so if, if this came in as maybe a put request or a delete request or some other weird HTTP request type for some reason, uh, there would be no route in our object, so this would be undefined. And so we would go to the uh, this part of the ternary statement, and this is where we would call our handle error function. Now we have completely eliminated the need for the switch, and that is it. So we have now completely replaced our routing and our Entry point for our suitelet has now 10 lines instead of, not even 10, seven lines, instead of the, I guess, you know, however many, whatever the sum of all three of these business process lines were, those were all inside of our entry point. And now our entry point, in order to figure out what this does, we just have to look at this, the setup of our uh, event router object and we can clearly see when we get a post we're going to call handle get so take me there or when we get a post we're going to call handle post so take me there um, so it clearly defines uh, the map the route that our script can take if we wanted to uh, and usually we will want to uh, if these functions needed some kind of input so maybe they need access to the context um, say on the get we wanted to, in order to render the form we've got a write to the response object that's easy enough we can give them all their own context parameter and then whenever we invoke them we just pass in the context and now when these execute they'll get past the context and then the get can do something like So we can also pass input to these handlers as well. They could return output. So maybe the uh, post, um, uh, maybe when it's processing, it's creating records and it could return maybe all the record IDs that it updated or created. And so you could say, could get output that way. Let's rewrite the client script following the exact same pattern. So on the left, we have our bad example, as it were. And on the right, we will rewrite that with the event router pattern. So the steps are the same. Copy the body over. And so this time, we don't have a, we have a if else structure instead of a switch, but like I said, the steps are the same. So the first thing we want to do is make separate functions for all of the different routes.
Okay, so we make one function per route, then we move the respective logic to the corresponding function. Then we define our router object. Now this time, since the keys uh, of our comparison are just uh, raw strings rather than uh, in the sweetlet we were using these enumeration values. Since they are plain strings, we can just take those strings and put them directly as the keys of our router. Okay, we have all the keys of our route set up, and we just need to map each field name to its function. Okay, we've mapped our keys to their function. So our, <coughs> our routes are set up. And now we need to set up the conditional on our field ID. So if you don't like the ternary format that we used here, there's a different approach that you can use. I like this, it's nice and concise, but we can do it slightly differently. So we need to check, do we have a route defined for the field ID that we get? separate these out a little bit visually. So we check for a route defined. So if the entity field is changing, for instance, this will be entity. So we will look for the entity property inside the event router, which it will find here. And so that will be uh, the handle entity change function. So type of, uh, the type of that property will be function. I'm actually going to flip this around. Um, so if this, if uh, maybe the, if we don't have a route defined, so maybe let's say the email field on the record changes, uh, this will be email. So we'll go look for an email property and it will not be there. There's no email property in our router. So this will be undefined. So the type of undefined is not a function. So we don't have a route defined, so there is nothing to do. So we just exit. Otherwise, if we get past that if, there is a route defined, and it is, we know it's a, a function, and so we can invoke that function. And now we can just get rid of our massive if else structure and so now right at the top so if we look at the left the quote-unquote bad example realize that's very opinionated subjective but uh, if we look at the left if I were to ask you which fields do we does this script handle what field changes does this script respond to you would have to go and look at all the if blocks and find the values we check and if you can imagine that, you know, inside of here, each of these is 10, each of these comments expanded out into like a 5, 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 line block of logic, you would be scrolling for days. But right here, right at the top of our field changed, if I asked you what fields do we handle, you can look right here at this single object and say, oh, we handle the entity, item, quantity, amount, rate. Right here, five lines, that's all you need to care about. Um, and from there, you can say, well, what do we do on the, the quantity change? Well, you come in here, you find the quantity property, you jump to its function, and now you can see exactly what we do on the quantity change. Okay. And, it, and the same thing happens here. If, if uh, these um, handlers needed input, you know, maybe they need to read, which very likely they need to read 
from the context. They need to get values off the current record. They need to change other values on the current record. So usually we want to pass the context into all these. So we need to set up a, an argument on each function definition. And when we actually go to invoke the function, we just pass in the right context and we're good to go. So that is the event router pattern that I love to use for these two scenarios. And uh, there's a lot of other similar scenarios. You see this similar pattern in other events like validate field, change field, uh, or um, post sourcing, I'm sorry. Um, you can see it in the sublist events a lot, checking which sublist is changing. Um, when you have really complicated routing structures like, like this, this is a nice, concise pattern for um, kind of making the code a little more readable, a little more maintainable uh, and understandable. So the event router takes advantage of the JavaScript language's treatment of functions as first class objects. And that essentially means that we can take functions like these, like our handler functions, we can pass them around um, as references, just like we can any other value, a number, a string, an object. Functions are no different. We can use function references as variable values, as parameter values in other functions, uh, and as properties within objects. And that last one is what we see here, right? We're setting uh, function references as properties inside of our objects or our event router object. So we kind of take this out of the sweet script world and just look at a plain, a pretty plain example in the console. Now let's kind of walk through what's happening here. Okay, so I've made a say hello function that just writes a loud message to the console saying hello. We can call that function directly, of course. And the console yells back at me. But I can also uh, pass this function, say hello, I can also pass it around. Um, I can set it as properties on objects, uh, like we're doing in our event router example. So maybe I have an object. And it might have some other properties. But I also want to augment it with the say hello function that I've already written. So this property right here should look a little bit like our properties in here. We have a key, a string key, just pointing to a function, a function name, a reference to a function, not an invocation of a function. It's not that. Uh, it's just a reference to the function. So I can create that object, and then I can invoke my say hello function through this do something property. And there, the console yells back at me. I didn't have to rewrite the code. I just uh, effectively renamed the say hello function within the context of this uh, object variable. I can also take the say hello function and pass it around as a parameter. Oops. So I have this do another thing that receives a function as an argument and the name is irrelevant. I could name it anything just like I always can, fn. It's just a nice abbreviation for function. And so I can just invoke whatever, whatever you pass in, I will invoke it with no uh, input. Okay, so then if I call do another thing, what do you think will happen? Oops, of course, I actually have to pass in my say hello function. Uh, I'm passing in, just again, I'm not, uh, I'm not invoking say hello. I am just passing in a reference to say hello. See that? 
and it calls my function. I don't even need, I can pass any function in here and it will invoke it with no parameters. Pops up an alert. No, there's no input defined. So functions in JavaScript are treated just like any other value. Uh, you can pass references of them around many different ways. And so that is what our event router does. We take advantage of that by setting up this nice concise map of our condition, our field name in this case, to its appropriate handler function. Now the major limitation of this pattern is that it doesn't work well when you have really complex conditionals as the basis for your routes. So if instead of uh, just being a field name, you know, there was some really complicated logic that th that determined when we called handle entity change, uh, this pattern wouldn't hold up well because you can't put complicated logic here. You can just put a string. Um, there are ways that you can hash complicated logics into or complicated conditionals into strings, but it's often not worth it and it's very confusing. It's hard to read. And now we've, if we do that, we've eliminated the purpose, uh, the advantages of the event router pattern. Um, so when you have complicated conditionals, this doesn't hold up well, but that's why it fits these, these scenarios I've showed, uh, shown here really well because the conditions aren't complicated. Uh, we change our logic based on uh, which field name is changing or which uh, request type we're getting. They're very simple, single values. Um, and that, that you see that pattern over and over in SweetScript where we, we do different logic based on a very simple conditional. Uh, which which field is changing? Which request type did we get? Which sublist is changing? Which uh, which event type is this? Is it a create? Is it an edit? Is it a uh, an inline edit? So this is a pattern I use all the time in my own code. Um, I think it's a nice, really concise way to represent these often uh, lengthy conditional conditionals that we have that we see in sweet script so if you have a client script like this where you have a massive if else structure and you've been looking to refactor it here is one one uh, nice way to do that with this pattern and that is it for this lesson if you liked what you saw in this video hit that thumbs up button Go share what you learned with somebody else. Click subscribe to stay up to date on all my videos and become a competent, confident SweetScript developer yourself. Thanks for watching, keep learning, keep sharing, and I'll see you next time.